Live from Las Vegas, Nevada, extracting the signal from the noise. It's the Cube covering Informatica World 2015. Brought to you by Informatica World. Now, here's John Furrier and Jeff Frick. Okay, welcome back everyone. You're watching live here in Las Vegas, the Cube Silicon Angles flagship program. We go out to the events and extract the signal from the noise. I'm John Furrier, my host Jeff Frick. We're here live at Informatica World 2015. Our next guest is Bill Burns, VP and CISO for Informatica. Welcome to the Cube. Thank you for having me. Chief Security Officer, Information Security, IT. It's the hottest area right now. Uh, you're on the planning committee for RSA. Um, a couple of weeks ago, the event was huge. Um, Top concerns, I mean, this is not no brainer. I mean, the headline today is no security breaches today. Yeah. Um, or security is sexy. Yeah, <laughs> security is <laughs> sexy. Give us the update, what's going on um, in the security space? Informatica is obviously tied into it, data is a big part of that. Yep. Uh, what are some of the top concerns right now for the security industry and, and, and management in the right. CISO role? I think there's a, there's a number of things going on. So obviously the, uh, the the amount of information is growing. The the ability to to secure it is trying to keep up with the growth, trying to keep up with the business. Um, that's hard, and it's also hard because you you have uh, scaling problems with employment. So it's negative unemployment in the security industry. So you have to figure out new ways to both build products and secure products, you know, both for customers and enterprises. Um, so that's a, that's a big issue. Um, the other big issue is we're seeing mobility take off. So last year I was doing some research for an investment cap or a venture capital company and CISOs that I polled were all concerned about the cloud and mobility and personal use and you know sort of work-life integration and you have, I think Gartner was saying in 2017, half of the enterprise traffic will go from a mobile phone to uh, a SaaS application. Won't even go through enterprise security controls. So all the stuff you used to buy, like your firewalls and your antivirus on your endpoints, those are sort of irrelevant. So how do you, as a, as a security practitioner, how do you manage the risk of security breaches, of privacy breaches of this, of this enterprise data when the endpoint the phone isn't your phone, it's you know, a consumer device. The network is a, a carrier like AT&T or Verizon, and the application is someone like Box or Workday. So IT traditionally had control of those, those components, it doesn't have control anymore. So how does the CISO manage risk or even think that they're managing risk effectively? So there's a, there's a, lot, of, you know, a lot of growth, a lot of change. And data's the heart of it, so I got to ask you on, on the piece of the security, um, how is security um, getting a do-over. We were talking before we kicked off the segment around right. <laughs> the computer industry. Yep. Uh, you know, I just saw a news story, Win Windows is not going to be built anymore, Microsoft's not going to build Windows anymore, that's an operating system. We've got uh, the Apple, doesn't have as many viruses because it's got you know, some <laughs> BSD in there. So, are we rethinking security? And as new products are being built, we are in a good opportunity to kind of do a do-over. Right. So what's your take on the security <laughs> do-over model right. and how data and architecture will fit into it? Yep, so I think there's a few things. One is, um, like we were talking about before, the internet of things, the, the way that we used to sell products, produce products, build products, and then try to secure it later on and sort of do a bolt-on. Right, right. That model doesn't work anymore, especially when you have something like a Fitbit, which has almost no interface to it, and you're shipping it to millions of customers who are going to slap it on and go running. They're not going to have time to be interacting with patch levels and updates. Like That model doesn't work, um, doesn't scale from what we did before with personal computers. Um, you're embedding them in cars. We talked about self-driving cars earlier. So these are these are systems and operating systems and, and use cases that are atypical from what we were doing before. Um, you know, managing security at scale is something that you do very differently than when you were doing it sort of you know, as an art. Um, now you need to automate things. You can't just bolt security onto your systems. Um, when you're trying to build a secure cloud infrastructure, for instance, it's not a serialized workflow where you do some work, you go home, Hopefully you hand it off to the next guy and then in a day or two or sometime later, he does his security thing. You, you've got to bake security into the infrastructure. You've got to make it part of the process. You know, they talk about continuous integration, continuous deployment, um, you know, agile security or you know, security um, DevOps. These are all ways of saying, 
look, security is just part of the game now. It's it's not something off on the side that you know specialists would would come in and then do security and disappear. It, it's it's got to be part of the the whole ecosystem of protecting the data or protecting the the car or it's the. It's got the, the same device. characteristics of the buzzwords we hear in 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 data real time. Yep. If it's baked in, it has to be always on, right? Right. Yep. <laughs> and it has to be compatible with how people consume the technology. APIs in the cloud, notifications <laughs> coming in. I mean, That's right, continuous monitoring, continuous patching. These, these are things, you know, I remember when Windows was, was first doing, or Microsoft was first doing patches on, you know, on a monthly basis, people were like, oh my gosh, month, every month we have to do patching? I, I would presume that we should be doing patching continuously. I mean, you look at some browsers yeah. and they're constantly updating. But you know, you have to make it convenient, but you just have to accept that security is just part of the, part of the, the discussion now. And yet, on the other hand, people's expectations of the behavior of the application is what needs to be less intrusive, less on their way, just works. You right. know, I just turn it on and That's go. That's right, yep. Um, and then you've got that, like you said, the agile methodologies, the DevOps, so the software right. is getting updated all the time. So yep. new potential holes uh, potentially being exposed very, very regularly. So yeah. a much more challenging environment. Yeah, as I, as I tell my, you know, my, my, my staff and, and you know, the, the, the people I advise, it's an arms race. I mean, this is not a not a new paradigm, but right, security right. is an arms race, and it's and it, the window of opportunity is getting shorter and shorter. It's it's you know it's happening faster and faster. So, you know, reaching to people and saying like, look, you're going to have to take some responsibility for the security of your car or your mobile phone. So, you know, successful security programs are learning to educate folks not just from a employee perspective, but from a, you're an online citizen 24 seven, the things I can teach you from a security perspective while you're employed with my company, those, to be effective, those will be lessons that you can take home and have you know, conversations with your family and say, look, here's, here's security, here's password security, here's social media security, here's updates and you know, uh, patches. So that's just part of the conversation. Talk about secure source um, and, and that product, what's going on with in practices and yep. how, how that's being rolled out. Yep. I think one of the big challenges, we started off the segment with, you know, what, what are some of the big challenges with companies? Part of the biggest problem is just visibility. Where, where is my critical assets? You know, so you always want to figure out where are your assets in your company, but now they're moving so fast. They're moving around, um, you know, they're, they're, the, the lines of business have control of the sensitive data. So where is that data? What type of data is it? What are the regulations that, that um, you know, constrain that data or that give you different controls that you have to put in place? So, you know, secure at source is a way to sort of scan the data that you already know is in these databases and say, what, what are the regulations around this? What type of data is it? Is it what you expected? In some cases, you know it should have, you know, let's say PCI data, but, you know, it, does it have HIPAA data in there as well? So, secure at source is a way to sort of scan the databases that you, that you know about, hopefully find some ones that you don't know about, and confirm what was the posture. What, and not from a batch mode, not something that you run you know, once a quarter, but you do it continuously, back on that theme of continuous you know, monitoring, continuous integration. What is the security posture at any moment in your company with your sensitive data, which is really the heart of what a security team is protecting is, is you know, the most sensitive information in the company. So talk about the product management piece of it, Informatica side, and also talk about what's going on with the customer accounts. So can you give us a, a bridge between the <coughs> capabilities and how customers are put into use? So it's an audit or something like that. You get, and then what happens next? What, do they right. reinvest? Is it like, they go, oh my God, I'm screwed, or <laughs> hey, I got to take action. I mean, it's got to be some, it's data, so it's, you, know, you right. get some base data. What, what's the iteration right. on the customer side? Yeah, I think one of the interesting things is it's got a really rich UI. So it's not just you know, a report with some data, but it actually lets you drill into it and you know, sort of ask questions and figure out, pivot through the, through the graphs. What, what does this mean to you? you know, ultimately there's a human element of providing content to the data, but it's going to tell you, here, here's what you told me to, to alert you on, here's the, the systems and changes, uh, the changes in the system, um, and now what are you going to, how are you going to make sense of this? Um, the, you know, the roadmap is going to be talking about protection That's controls. key, that's a good point, because if you don't have a good UI, then no one wants another dashboard that's that hard to use. Right. It's really critical that you have that ease of use. Exactly. Of yep, so you know, it's a very pretty dashboard, yeah. but it's actually actionable. You can go in there and you know, ask interesting questions. You get value pretty quickly. Within a couple hours of my team deploying it, and you know, I, I strived to be customer zero. I wanted to be the, the first one to kick the tire. So when we brought it in, I think we have 100, roughly 150 data sources right now that we're scanning, and we're just getting started. It's a relatively new product about out about a month, but it, it within a couple hours we were able to confirm 
you know, these data sources should have this type of data. Is that, is that what we're seeing? Yes, it is. Okay, great. How about this other data source? Well, we were expecting more data. Why aren't we seeing more? Or we, we didn't realize it was going to have this flavor of data. So let's go talk to that administrator and say, we, we know what you were supposed to be doing, but here's what you're doing differently that surprised us. Now, you know, it was nothing catastrophic, but it was a way to start having a conversation, and I knew that it was going to be continuously updating. So it wasn't a hide from the security team until the next quarterly audit, but <laughs> now I can, I can you know, have a conversation with these guys and say, hey, I know it's another change, what, what's going on? So it's an early product, early customer feedback um, you know, is it, starting to come in, but you know, from my perspective, it's been really interesting, and now I'm thinking of other use cases for it, like where, what other environments in my ecosystem can I apply this system to go out and sort of double check what is the security posture for the sensitive data? So what does the age of engagement mean to you as a CISO mm -hmm. when it comes to engagement data? Because uh, we were having this philosophy earlier, I mean to me is it, I'm engaging on Twitter, I'm engaging with retail data, I'm engaging with threat data, breach data, or potential pattern data coming in off right. probes and devices, yep. systems. This is so another area that's, that's sort of in a renaissance for the security industry. Tr traditionally, companies were siloed, they were very secretive, they might get some information from a third party or from a government agency, but it was, it was all these silos of information yeah. we didn't share very well. Um, now people are actually engaging in, in either building private communities, um, which we've had for a while, but you know, larger private communities and sponsored by other products, and we're sharing information more readily. So now there's open source intelligence you know, frameworks or, or feeds that allow security professionals to be more engaged with each other. I'm not a, a unique snowflake in terms of you know, the attack surface. There, there are peers of mine who, have, who are seeing similar attacks, or maybe they're, they're seeing the first attack. I would love to know about that, and I would love to share that, you know, those insights with my peers so that we can become more secure together. So That was a big theme, by the way, at RSA, which was, right. do you share the data, and that culture of, it's always been a culture of sharing and security, but at a whole other level, corporate to corporate, right. government to corporate, there's a lot of that stuff going on. What's right, and it's messy, so it's really messy data right now. It's unstructured, um, there's, there's a lot of context missing. Yeah. You have to have a lot of, uh, a lot of intelligence, a lot of context from a practitioner standpoint to, in, to take this data, ingest it, and say, okay, what does this mean to me? What are the bits and pieces? It's, it's messy. There are some early, some early initiatives like stack, uh, Sticks and Taxi that try to structure that data, but we're just getting started. So it's a very it's messy exciting, process. Actually. It's actually an exciting opportunity. Yeah. Don't yeah. you think, I mean, if you can create some sort of way to have it discoverable, you right. know, like a, like a search engine kind of way? Yep, right. exactly. That'd be very interesting. Yep. But or even push alerts out. Yes, um, that, that's another thing is, it's one thing to, you know, to get an alert and have it sent to a system that you review once in a while, but then how do you actually take action on that? So rather than getting an alert that I know I'm going to follow the next five steps, why don't you automate that response? Why don't you take the most likely or maybe the, the safest uh, approach at quarantining or you know, segmenting a system that may be in, you know, in danger or in, in operating in an unsafe way, why don't you automate some of those response characteristics? That's one of the early um, early areas of security innovation that I see. Um, I, I actually uh, helped build a system of just, which was just open source last week um, in a prior, prior company. Um, you're starting to see a, a new small ecosystem of companies that are building out this automated response or automated resiliency system. So again, taking the data and you know, building expert systems to go take action. You know, what is the most likely thing that needs to get, to get done to protect the company from this you know, type of attack? Right. But it's interesting, because then you get the lawyers, I'm sure, that get involved. And you know, there's always this <laughs> statistic right. that, that goes around that you know, people don't know they've been breached for an average of 200 and some odd days or whatever exactly. that number is. Right. So yeah, yeah. Now just the fact that I'm sharing with you that I've been breached, let me share with you the information to give you some security. Right. Then I'm basically admitting that I've been breached, and does that open up a whole other can of worms? Yeah. So, right. Um, you know the legal aspects and the and the significant business impact, the legal impact of these breaches is huge. Exactly. Yep. And you know I know some people want to take it a step further and you know sort of automate not just response but hack back. You know if they can attribute this this attack to a country or a particular yeah. organization, like why can't I go attack them? Another can of worms from a legal perspective. But at the very least. You know, we're, we're all not that unique. Why don't we find a way to safely share that information? So you know, that share that intelligence, so we yeah. can you know be more informed. It's interesting. It, if you, everyone that I know is in security has some sort of gaming background. That attack back, you know, <laughs> Counter Strike, you know, <laughs> Call of Duty. I mean, it's like, I mean, it goes back to the sp old spam days. Um, right. 
So I got on that note, I want to ask you a personal question, and we really get a lot of folks, um, younger folks, watch as well, some senior people in the industry. Yeah. Security is a real hot area to take to go after, and from a discipline standpoint. Yep. I see a lot of kids who aren't necessarily computer science, love gaming, or get hooked on computer science through through their uh, you know millennial touch points, phone, right. gaming. What, what advice would you give young people about, you know, if they have an interest in, say, you know, some of the root technology and or security, right. what should they do? Is there things that you recommend? What kinds of courses should they read, go take? Books should they read? Right. Or games they should play? What, what's the advice would you share, you yep. know, someone out there in their teens or even in college? Yep, that's great. So um, my, my team actually hired our first security intern uh, for the first time at Informatica, which is... Fantastic. So this is this is a person in college. He's you know about two or three years through his career, and um, we're really look, looking forward to giving him practical experience to sort of hone the, the skills that he's that he's that he's grown over time. From someone who's who's not yet in college and maybe not yet in high school, I would say you, you want to foster that curiosity. That that person is very creative. He's trying to figure out not just how something works, but why does it work that way? And what happens if I do it just a little bit differently? Can I make it, you know, sort of, can, can I fuzz the system? Um, those, are, those are the traits that I look for when I'm inter interviewing someone, when I'm looking to hire someone, is, you know, that curiosity, that passion of, you know, it's, it's a game. What, what can I do to make this thing work differently or work better? Not necessarily maliciously, but, you know, just from a, from a traditional hacking also perspective. Also outside the box thinker, probably, right. like, you know, connecting the dots kind of thing, yep, seeing exactly. patterns. And, and I think one of the, one of the trends that, I'm, that I'm, I'm a strong advocate for is programming skills. So get the math background, get the computer science degrees, get the, get the programming skills that will help you not just figure out how to make something work, but work um, in an automated fashion. Yeah. The security didn't like scale Like from a before. tooling standpoint, right. looking at coding as, as to pr prep tooling right. and or wrangling data. Yep, I, I think the security products in the future will have APIs. Uh, in fact, the, the ones that I select in, you know, in, in, in my current role, they must have APIs. Uh, if, I, if I can't interoperate two things together, I don't want to hire one person to run a, you know, a console and click on buttons. I want, I want him to orchestrate our response or our intelligence platform. So, um, you know, programming skills are extremely important. So, you know, have that have that young person. Which language? Python? Would it be like um, something different? What, what kind of language? All the cool kids are doing Python right now. Um, I used to be in Perl, and I, I don't think it really matters. If you have a good programming background, you can adapt. You can figure out, and you'll be curious, yeah. and so you'll want to learn yeah. Go, and you'll want to learn, you know, all, all the new yeah. languages. Hip, yeah, like hip stuff. Whether, you exactly. Know, yeah. So if you learn some base structured programming, right. understand how to deal with data structures and whatnot, you're going to be good. Yep. All right, Bill. Great conversation. Yeah. Uh, we kind of so went much. off on the <laughs> off the reservation a little bit there, but it's good. Right. Good he content. Needs more people, right? It's a good job no, opportunity I mean, for people uh, looking for uh, right. careers. I yeah, see. Yeah, no, I see people, and I encourage people who don't know they're actually growth. getting addicted to the science side of it. Or actually, should be like just jump in. You're okay. You don't yep. have to have the degree, or you don't have to have some sort of course in school to go there. So right. I think that's one of the things I like about security is that people actually have an affinity towards it. Yeah, Might and the more diverse it. in your background, I think the better. Yeah, Bill Burns, VP CISO Informatica. This is the Cube sharing the data with you. We'll be right back after this short break.